Welcome. My name is Carolyn Woodard, and I'm the Director of Outreach for Community IT. We always have so much good information to pack into our webinars that today we are trying something different. Three of our senior executives and engineers interviewed each other on emerging trends in high tech that we get asked about and how they will impact the nonprofit sector. I have edited these interviews into three episodes and I'm happy to start out with this discussion, which is on virtual and augmented reality and where this technology might be going and when it might become standard at nonprofits and how it might be useful. They also touch on how meetings have changed in the pandemic and what meetings might be like in the future. I'll let our experts introduce themselves and get right into the discussion. So my name is Johan Hammerstrom. I'm the CEO at Community IT. I've been with Community IT for 23 years and I started off on the technical side and then moved into management, but I miss the technology and I like talking about it with uh, nonprofits specifically but also any of my colleagues who are willing to still let me pretend like I'm technical, you know, I'm happy to have these conversations. Um, so I'm happy to be here today with, uh, with Steve. Steve, sure. you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Steve Longenecker. I'm the director of IT consulting at Community IT. I have been at Community IT for 18 years. I know that because I joined Community IT about a month after my son was born and he is at his first year of college now. So that's how I mark the passage of time for myself and my uh, career at Community IT. Uh, I also really enjoy technology, obviously, working at an IT company and look forward to this conversation with you, Johan. My name is Noura Abuki. I'm an IT business manager and a senior consultant at Community IT. I have been at Community IT for 13 years. Uh, currently, I advise our clients on best practices for managing technology infrastructure. I also conduct technology assessments, develop IT plans, and build strategic IT roadmaps, including uh, budgeting for our clients. So it's really great to be with you, Johan, and I look forward to our conversation about future trends in IT and the nonprofit sector. Sometimes it takes a long time for technology to become mature, you know, and, and even though we all saw the cloud was coming, even though we all saw that mobile devices were going to be, um, a big deal. It took a long time. It took 10 years in some ways for that to kind of work itself out as um, consumer and business ready technology solutions that could be, you know, implemented effectively and at a reasonable, at a reasonable cost. Um, so, you know, cloud is not like a buzzy term at all anymore. It's become sort of so common, so much the normal way that technology is hosted and implemented that it almost doesn't make sense to talk about cloud anymore because it's, it's just the standard, you know? Right. Um, and so as we think about where technology is going over the next 10 years, and specifically like some of the things that are the buzziest right now, I think it's important to remember that it could take a while. Like we don't exactly know where these things are going, and if anything, I feel like it's even less certain now, like what's, what's coming over the next 10 or 15 years to me feels even less certain than things like cloud and Office 365 felt back in 2012. I think there's a lot of unanswered questions about what's happening next with technology um, that makes it hard to predict what's gonna happen. So it can make some of the buzzy things um, seem far-fetched or unrealistic, but I think the reality is that most of the most of the tech that's like buzzy right now or that gets a lot of hype will probably eventually turn into something that we are all using in some some form or fashion. Once Microsoft figures out how to you know commercialize it and incorporate it into their product scheme. Um, but the, the buzzy, you know, when I think of like IT buzzwords, obviously AI, artificial intelligence, sure. machine learning, virtual reality, and crypto are the right. ones that I think always seem to, to come up. So it's not, and I don't think it's, I don't think any of those 
technologies are purely hype. I think there's some potential area of development in in each with each of those, and some interesting things that are starting to happen in those in those different areas. Right. Maybe it's not as as buzzy, but maybe another uh, trend that is sort of sneaking up on us. Um, and, but it's also probably on that kind of time range, you know, as I wonder about like the, not so much the demise of the traditional document, but like this idea, this, this idea of being, of going paperless, you know, is, um, uh, has been around for since 2012, I'm sure. Um, and in some ways is sort of, is, has, has in fact matured to the point that I think there's a lot less paper floating around than there was 10 years ago for sure. Um, but the fact that there are now so many more ways of, of sort of disseminating information that aren't, that aren't like hearkening back to a, something that you would print out. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it, it, it used to be the case that you would, if nothing else, you could always print it if you wanted to. And, and I think we're seeing more and more things now that are like, you can't really print it anymore. Like you only can sort of interact with it um, on a screen, I guess, right now. And maybe at some point, you know, maybe at some point it won't even be on a it won't even be on a traditional screen. It'll be on a on a VR, you know, headset that you have to interact with this information. You know, um, so um, that's kind of exciting to think about. Uh, and I know that you know there are. Um, startups that are you know trying to to change that that way the way documents work you know what what they are and they're not they're you know documents 2.0 almost you know and they're not and so you know you talked about microsoft and how it that's the that's the uh the mark of at which um the technology has matured is when microsoft has finally been able how to how to <laughs> you know productize it for for their purposes and that's there's a lot of truth to that but i've also wonder whether and I'm not predicting the, the end of Microsoft at all. They've been really, uh, for a huge corporation, impressively nimble in um, sort of changing their, their approach from sort of being a Windows-centric company to a services Microsoft 365-centered company. But so much of their uh, power comes from the fact that people still really live, live in Word and Excel, at least I do. Um, but I'm old, you know, my son's 18 now. So I wonder whether like, you know, coming up more and more that 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 reliance on the traditional document will ease and if that'll that'll change things. And I and I wonder whether, you know, uh, virtual reality will be part of that. Like that'll that would change things if you could look at data sort of three dimensionally and not just um, not just on a on something that you print, you know. Yeah, one piece of paper. I, I think that's a really great insight. The whole like moving to a printerless world, and I think there is like a generational aspect to it. You know, I I remember I happened to go to a number of baseball games this year, and at a, at a variety of different ballparks. And it wasn't that long ago. Like I remember going to see the Nats in like 2015, 2016, and you could buy your tickets online, but then you had to print them out and carry these like printouts with you down to the ballpark and um and now like it's all the 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 default is it's on your mobile device and if you want to go to the trouble of printing your tickets out you have to go through a lot of extra steps and so right. i think in a lot of different parts of our society i think the pandemic really pushed that along mm -hmm. because People, I think, probably were printing a lot of stuff at work, and when they couldn't go to work to use the printer, and it's like, well, I don't have access to a printer anymore. All right, well, we've got to like move to a printerless society and find ways to convey information without, you know, without a printer. Right. And I think young people are way beyond that. You know, they it, they don't really they can't recall a time when you would actually print something out and sign it physically sign it like it just doesn't those things make less and less sense to them and it's it's interesting that pretty much all legal contracts now are docu-signed with a few exceptions like our bank you know requires us to physically sign 
certain documents, but most documents are DocuSign. And the, the, the format of DocuSign, which is you go into a website and you click a button. And what that button does is it puts like a, a sort of recreation of your physical signature on an electronic document. It's so antiquated. Like it doesn't. I know. It, it, it is imagine strange. Like 20 years from now, right. no one's, no one's going to be, you know, doing that anymore. Right. No, that's true. So what, so we were talking about, about, uh, virtual reality and we, we have, to, there's a bunch of these topics we can hit on, but like, what are, what are the use cases for virtual reality that you could imagine hitting the nonprofit space at some point? I mean, right now, my sense is that the headsets are too clunky. They're, they're heavy, they're expensive. They're not that high res, um, the battery's not long enough. I mean, there's all these, there's all these uh, problems um, that are the same problems that, you know, at one time, you know, if you wanted to have a mobile device, you were carrying around like a briefcase and that was your mobile device. That was a long time ago, but I remember those days. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, you know, they got it into a size that it would fit in your pocket. And then, and then it just got more, became, you know, more powerful than the computers used to be not that long ago. Um, so one can imagine that, um, that the that they'll solve the engineering challenges of the mobile device but what what business what are what are the business cases that are that sort of driving this investment that people are envisioning um obviously you can have virtual meetings that are much richer than the one we're having now where you're just a, a flat image on a mm -hmm. in a window that i'm looking at on my on my computer screen it would be you know the idea that we're both wearing some sort of lightweight helmet type thing. And, and it feels like we're actually in the same room together. Um, sounds really cool. I'm, I'm not convinced it's all that compelling, although you and I both listen to a podcaster that has experienced it and says that it really is a different experience. And it really does feel like you're in the same room. And there's something powerful about that. And, and we both obviously have our, our community IT provide services to clients that have spent a lot of money to build out conference rooms to provide that experience to the best of their ability, you know, for, for the board of directors, when, when three members can't, can't physically be in the conference room, they want that experience for those board, for those members to be, um, you know, as good as it can be. So they, they don't, they don't go cheap. They, they have a nice AV system in their, in their, boardroom or their conference room. Um, and I guess a VR headset will someday displace that. Um, what else, what else would do you, do you think uh, VR does? Is it, or is it mostly, is that, is that it probably? Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I think it maybe takes over that job. Mm -hmm. um, although it's funny that you mentioned the AV systems, because if there's one component of the, modern offices IT that is unreliable, difficult to use, and eternally frustrating, it's audio visual systems. So absolutely. Uh, even getting those to like uh, the, the stability that the rest of the IT environment has would be a win, much less like getting it into the, the realm of, um, you know, uh, virtual reality, um, which is, you know, as another aside, like one of my big um, uh, skepticisms of VR is there's sort of a lot of hand waving that goes on like when we figure out all the technical challenges and it's like well that's not a you know an aside like that's actually the key issue and if you know there's certain like the laws of physics have certain limitations that simply cannot be overcome and it's not you know the things we have today are incredible and there's no reason to think that like Apple, for example, who's supposedly working on a VR headset and, you know, and has done some remarkable things with technology. It seems like if anybody were able to figure out how to make VR work, it would be, it would be Apple. Um, but there's no guarantee that it, that it will. But if it does, I also wonder if it doesn't just, it also sort of transforms like it creates new ways of working that are hard for us to 
imagine yet right because we don't we don't have them that's what i was talking about like with the 3d the 3d presentation of data like that's just sort of mm -hmm. hard to imagine but like that could potentially could be really powerful the way yeah. that um uh you know power bi and the visualization of data now like you just couldn't do it before before those systems came into being the the visual the data visualization is kind of a whole that's kind of a new thing that is enabled by technology i mean it's not that new but it's not it's it didn't you know back when i was in grade school we would make our graphs on graph paper you know and it's just what like it's just a different it's just so much um faster now so the idea that you could add another dimension to your data analysis visualizations is kind of cool that's kind of cool. Yeah. And think back to like Facebook and Twitter in 2006, you know, before the iPhone came out. It was they, they were browser based, you know, like you right. got to Twitter and you got to Facebook by going to a website on your desktop and posting and scrolling and reading and and on the one hand like what those apps do on mobile is in theory similar but the social and and human impact that having those apps with you all of the time right. has completely changed sort of how they get used and how their use impacts society you know it wouldn't have the same level of impact if it weren't happening in a mobile way so right. it there could be subtle changes to how we work that VR brings about that um we just have a hard time anticipating, right? Uh, you know, uh, VR and AR, and kind of the different possible use cases. And noting that um, Facebook had signed an agreement, uh, is entered in Facebook Meta entered into a partnership with Microsoft, and the thinking is that Microsoft is interested in creating a VR experience for Teams. So that when you meet with somebody, you could meet with them, you know, in a virtual, more of a virtual reality environment. But you could imagine like in medical environments, you know, like um, AR could be useful. I mean, what do I know about surgery, right? So I'm just <laughs> yeah. making stuff up, in, but, you know. Yeah, that <laughs> quite it has potential in training, remote training for volunteers. and Remote training, and, and yep. a, yes, in, in a variety of... Uh, uh, sectors and I I know that uh, the first air uh, example I saw was through a mechanic uh, where mm -hmm. you know they will ask you to put on this <laughs> glass and then they will walk you through how to fix your car or a component in your car. So, but that's just when I first uh, got introduced to it. But I know so it definitely has a lot of potential for us in the tech sector, providing support as well as. Uh, even our uh, clients that do volunteer, they can train their volunteers in a variety of programs using yeah. AI. Yeah. Uh, someone else suggested, I mean, it's not my idea, but the, the fact that if VR is, if you can put a helmet on your head and see like this huge, you know, field of vision with all this sharp graphics that, um, you, the, you know, one of the things that, um, that I find frustrating, you know, right now I'm sitting in my home office and I have my laptop, but I also have a nice big, very large screen right next to it. And I can really have a lot of different windows open at the same time. And that creates a lot of efficiencies for me. But if I take my laptop out of my home office, then I'm, I'm suddenly back down to my 14 inch screen. And it just, it, you know, my, 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 my efficiency is, 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 it's not like I can't get work done, but it, it definitely, um, is impacted by that. And this idea that perhaps at some point, what we need to carry around is hopefully a not too big, you know, thing that just sort of gets right in your, right over your eyes. And mm -hmm. then you suddenly have like, not an infinite workspace, but, but you, you know, you could actually go even further over and see even more words and texts and graphics that you're, that you're working with. Um, and uh, that's kind of that's kind of cool. Um, I've also um, I know that you know Microsoft 
or did they have some sort of VR or, or augmented reality is, is like the other thing. And this idea that, um, you know, if they're, if they're ubiquitous enough and cheap enough that all of our clients might have them and they can flip one on and then I can have my, my perspective can be the perspective of the person that I'm, that I'm talking to and they can walk over to the server room which won't, there won't be a server room because if everything's in the cloud, it's 10 years from now or whatever, but you know, whatever. If there's something that needs to be solved on one premise, I can sort of see what they're seeing and, and can even, you know, maybe point in their mm -hmm. field of vision. Look, look at that. That's what I want you to look at. You know, whereas now when those uh, situations occur, it's, you know, we, and they do occur, they, you know, okay, so do you see a, a black, thing about the size of a cigar box, which, you know, of course, I realized, you know, when was the last time any of us, you know, <laughs> bought a cigar or used a cigar box, except, you know, my grandfather had lots of them, you know, and he's long gone now, but like, you know, carry holding screws and nails and stuff, but like, yeah. you know, whatever. But like, my point is that it's, that would be great to have like that, that kind of headset -y thing where you can sort of, it can be a camera, onto a real reality, but that can then be, um, you know, uh, uh, sent back over the, the internet to, to someone else and they can see what the person's seeing. It is, it does seem like something that could have enough uses um, that, that there probably are, there is probably money to be made, which is always the question, is there money to be made? And, some, and people invest in these things on the faith that there's money to be made to some extent. But um, um, th that investment should, should the technology sh will get better, whether it gets to be good, good enough, you know, your skepticism on that is noted and, and well, I, I think, don't know, but I think I, it's gonna come. The stuff is yeah, gonna and come. I think, I think what you hear is that augmented reality is probably happening sooner than complete virtual reality. And right. you could imagine like at a data center, like Amazon's data center, Microsoft's data center, they just have rack, rows and rows of racks, racks and racks filled with servers. And all of those servers have components that are being monitored and, and managed. And if those can, if something fails, if you could like plug that into a set of uh, augmented reality glasses, then the engineer just walks into the server room and the augmented reality glasses like starts lighting up arrows that sort of right. lead them to the rack. They look at the rack and there's the augmented reality overlays like red over the server that's failed. And that seems to me like a really um, compelling use case. And especially for those large tech companies, that's the kind of sort of augmented reality solutions that may already be in place or that, you know, they're most likely to be the early adopters. Right. For. Right. The other thing that I'll, we, we can, we should probably, turn to other topics but i will say that like that that um we can just go ahead and give a shout out the, the the blog the the blogger and podcaster that i was talking about is a guy named ben thompson and his he writes a lot about uh technology he does a lot of analysis of technology and technology companies and um he is you know because of that he was he was trialing um the, i guess they were the 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 Quest 2, so this is you know Meta's product that, or Facebook's Meta's product that's not the newest, greatest one, but the one that has been out for a little while. And he was using them for virtual meetings with his, his team of, of developers and so on. And he was just saying that it really made a, a different experience of the meetings than a Zoom meeting. And um, not to say that, that, that's, that that's a single data point, so who knows, but it's interesting that he was, getting that experience uh, with, you know, what I'm sure five years from now will be viewed as a very antiquated, very old fashioned, yeah. you know, piece of equipment. And yet yeah. he, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, going back to the, the games that I played when I was a kid on computer games, I mean, I played computer games. And if you go back and you look at them, you know, it's like the, the pixels are, is, you know, the graphics are quote unquote terrible. Mm -hmm. But I had a lot of fun playing those games and, and I'm not trying, fun and productive, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> mixing them here, okay? But my point is that, that it could be that 
uh, we don't we don't realize because we haven't had a chance to use that use this equipment enough, and it hasn't become part of our regular lives enough. And that might just happen over time anyway. It may not take the most incredible. You may not need to feel like you're in real reality when you put these mm -hmm. things on for it to still start for it to still feel like it has a real good use case. In other words, you may, I may be interacting with you in virtual reality and you may look like uh, a cartoon figure instead of like Johan. And I'm like, that's not Johan. That's a cartoon <laughs> version of Johan. I, anybody can see that. I'm done with this and I take it off and I throw it away. <laughs> that may not happen. I might be like, that's, that's a cartoon version of Johan, but it's still like somehow creating a sense of presence and, right. and it's really still working. Yeah. Um, and that and that could happen. And in that, if that's the case, there is a technology improvement. I think the heaviness and the um, the battery and just like the, the degree of trouble it is to put this thing on and take it off and yeah. some of the motion sickness stuff. There's some things that are that that are like that need to be solved. But like I'm not sure that the graphics need to become like, oh, I feel like I'm in reality, you know, like uh, in science fiction movies. Um, yeah. For it to to start really being useful, and that's an interesting that's an interesting trade off, because if that's true, then really it's a matter of like solving some of the like, not such a hard lift, getting the heaviness down, getting the battery better, and those are that's sort of that's gonna, I don't think be that hard, and then it's a matter of sort of changing our habits, and that will take that might take a while, but we've already seen how much more we're using Zoom than we were. Now that took took a worldwide pandemic maybe in some ways to get that to happen but i think that was an accelerant i think in fact you know we are all more comfortable having uh virtual meetings where and 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 we barely ever use the telephone anymore you know for well business. it's pretty yeah i mean i think that's a great example of how things can change both quickly but also subtly and and you know and and the degree and the extent to which um small improvements can have an enormous impact, right? Like the fact that we're able to talk over video and not rely solely on a phone call, I think has made an enormous difference for everybody, you know, running businesses and organizations over the course of the pandemic. Like imagine, I just can't imagine having to do all of this solely through phone calls, you know, mm -hmm. which would have been the case 20 years ago, probably right. 15, maybe even 10 years ago. Right. Um, Not just also, because we can see each other, but because we can share our screens. I mean, that's really been- We can share a screen. Yeah. Here. Like there's so much more interaction that can happen. Right. And, and when you consider this compared to what might be coming 15, 20 years from now, this is going to feel rudimentary. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, Skype, was around in 2005, I think. Right. I mean, right. like video, this sort of video calling has been theoretically available for 15 years, but it wasn't really until, I don't know, 2017, 2018, that it started to become a, a, a real option. You know, like there were bandwidth issues, there were technology issues. I mean, Zoom really like, because I mean, and Microsoft once again is so illustrative because how many versions of this did they do? You know, right. they had Link, they had Link, for, they had uh, Skype, they bought Skype, they had Skype for business. And we used all of those and they were all terrible. They were right. pretty much unusable. Right. And then suddenly somehow Teams was like, well, actually Teams seems to <laughs> work pretty well. Right. Um, and Still who, not and perfectly, but. It's not perfectly, yeah, yeah. But the format is kind of the same as what we were trying to do back in 2005, but they finally figured the technology right. out. So the, part of enough, was, the minimum viable, you know, which right. is I think what you're saying, like what's the minimum viable product it's, here? That's part of it. And and some of that was just like, you know, bandwidth. That's that's just like, and, and that was, and the fact that we all have enough bandwidth at our homes is driven, you know, more by the fact that, you know, some of us grew up with teenagers in the house that wanted, uh, to be able to do their gaming or, you know, we wanted to watch stream Netflix. I mean, I wonder how much like mm. those things are all like flywheels, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. Netflix can't exist without bandwidth, but the presence of Netflix and the fact that everyone's chattering about whatever the latest, greatest streaming show is drives 
those of us who don't have it yet to get more to buy more bandwidth. Right. Which which if there's more people buying more bandwidth, the the bandwidth delivery companies can get more efficient because more customers on the block means you know that drawing that cable down to that block gives them more revenue so they don't mind doing it and then they can deliver cheaper prices to each you know so all of these things mm -hmm. um reinforce it and then once in a while not that we should be asking for this but you know like the pandemic was an, like an accelerant like it's just like lighting a match to a you know all the ingredients were in place and then suddenly the whole world adopted zoom and teams and um whatever else is out there uh because they were suddenly they suddenly couldn't go to their offices anymore at least you know for a while so yeah, yeah. it's interesting thank you for joining us for part one of this discussion on high tech and nonprofits. you can find part two and three if you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts you can get in touch with us on our website to suggest future topics you'd like us to talk about